So good morning. Um, it's great to, to be back at the sketching school. Um, I've I've and have having tried some of your techniques during during the week, Chris. It was fun to. I'm I'm finding I'm really enjoying having the sketching school because it it pushes you to like try new things with your drawings and stuff. And um, so, and I'd also like to just acknowledge that um, I'm hosting this today from the lands stolen from the Sequetmecchin peoples during colonialism and to acknowledge that this is their traditional lands. Um, and so, Chris, do you have a way you like to host the, the feedback session or would you like to jump into one of the drawings or what would you like to do? Yeah, we could just start looking at drawings and talking about them. Jenna, do you want to show us your drawings? Yep, for sure. Um, so I'm guessing you're all on the mirror board. I don't need to share. Um, so I think what I was working with kind of this week is was the, Chris was talking about that I liked. It was the idea of layering. Um, and then um, and then on top of that, just kind of experimenting. So one thing I wanted to try was the top left was the house in a dream. So what uh, what I'm interested about is I always kind of dream in spaces how they aren't are in reality. And I wanted to try to represent that. Um, so it was kind of it's kind of hard because you're trying to kind of look back on something, you know, you've only seen in your mind um, and not seen in reality, but it does represent a piece of reality. So um, so that's kind of what I've ended up with with this sketch here um, and it's it's my parents house and I've had this dream before um, and it, it's my parents house and each kind of room in the house is represented by its own little weird kind of area um, and yeah there's part of the dream is in the dream there's a squirrel that's holding scissors so I've kind of layered done a few layers on it um, just to kind of yeah make it uh, pop out a bit more, but not be the whole focus of the image. Um, so there's that. And then the other stuff is kind of stuff though. Well, the other, this one on the right here is what I'm working on for a studio. Um, it's a project that is on a knoll that's fully, uh, fully treed. Um, so I was just kind of working with like initial concept, um, concept ideas um, and the idea uh, of just kind of sketching without erasing, which I'm not used to. Uh, the bottom bottom left is that same knoll, but just a 30 second sketch that I took um, trying to understand the land. Um, and then the one on the bottom right is just a sketch inside uh, my house that I just did quickly. And just kind of the, I tried the idea that I believe it was you, Chris, talking, doing the, you didn't call it doodling, but you called it something else. Um, and I tried to do that and it kind of just ended up looking like yours. So I'm like, oh, I'll just try doing something that's like in my mind. So I'm not thinking of it too much, but still getting hand to paper. So yeah, that's what I worked on this week. Really intrigued by the, the house and the dream. Um, you know, for me, if I thought of, or I saw the squirrel with the scissors, I, that's the, I would put that image in here, right? Like it either draw it or appropriate an image and kind of collage it together. I think yeah. sometimes too, and I, you know, um, drawing like this, and even when I um, teach this to my, my own students, um, I tell them that like, <clears throat> in some cases, the collage like aspects don't have to conform to the same projection method, meaning like it doesn't have to be in the right um, perspective, right? Like it doesn't right. have to always be, it might seem a little off and that's okay. I mean, so it's a squirrel with scissors, right? But <laughs> uh, but that's kind of the point, right? It's the, I think that that's the part of our sort of cognitive system that I'm trying to tap into because there's something, some meaning in there, but I just don't know what it is, right? Yeah. And so when I'm teaching that sort of methodology to my students too, I say it is like a dream because it, you know, you're 
brain is taking in cognitive information. And then when you're sleeping, your brain resorts it. Yeah. And it might put things together in ways that don't quite make sense, but at, in some ways they do, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why I like this idea of like tapping into this kind of dreamlike state as you're drawing. Um, and so when those images, I don't think come in your mind, like you don't have to figure out why it's happening or the value of it. I think it's just important to represent it, like to, to make it. Um, so I would like to see you expand on the house, right? Like in, show it to us in section or show it to us exploded in some way. Um, you know, I often, and I don't know why, but I think ever since I was a child, I've had dreams, maybe other people do too, um, where the spaces inside my dream are places I know, like inside my house or my bedroom, but things are upside down or they're completely backwards. And I yeah. think that that's what that is. It's just like the cognitive information is in your brain and your brain has resorted it. Um, and so I think that's okay to draw like that too. Like if it's not exactly how you think it um, is or should be as a designer, then well, it's, it's perfectly fine. You know, like to flip, flip the thing upside down or flip it sideways um to begin to think about it in that way yeah i was also really intrigued by this when when i opened the the mural board this morning and saw it and it's i as you were talking i was thinking too it's interesting also to sort of think about what it could communicate from your subconscious of what you know uh, uh, of what a home is what yeah. to you is is makes a home comfortable or safe or um uh yeah it's uh that's kind of what that's kind of why I wanted to 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 work on that this week because I you know I thought it could tell me something about how I understand spaces um so yeah I think it's kind of and I just I remember this dream very clearly so it's the one that I worked on but now I'm hoping to have more in the future where I can be like oh I could try to sketch that <laughs> like and it, it, I think too, it begins to get at some of the issues that Sechaba was talking about in his talk as well about sort of when he when he showed the the house that he grew up in with the snake wrapped around it, um, to to sort of begin to address some of the trauma that had occurred in that house. And so, to me, there's enormous amount of of energy in this drawing, and. Um, and you know, I think that's something that we often don't express as strongly in in architectural drawings is is the sort of the histories of the place that that you know that that absolutely contribute to the spaces that we design there and how we and how we um, uh, experience those spaces and how that it's very different for different people depending on their personal lived experiences. Thank you. Sure. Um, would you like to, uh, I, Hala, do you have drawings you'd like to share? I do, and I'm uploading them, but I, I'm still looking for one set that I'd like to share if that's okay. Sure. I already put two here, um, but I, I really want to share these set of drawings. Okay, do you want, do you want to finish doing that and we can talk about there's Chris has some drawings here. I put a drawing up that I did experimenting with Chris with Chris's um, techniques. Yeah, yeah that sounds that great. Helpful. Okay. So we have some drawings here that um, that Chris put up. If you want to, do you want to comment? Have have any suggestions or comments on these, Chris? I think that uh, what I understand about this is that trying to work in the almost a serial kind of way. I think too that um, I, I well I I do that too. Like I draw thumbnails uh, and then go back and sort of embellish the drawings. Um, 
this is interesting to me because it's like the same scene multiple times, which I think there's value in doing, right? Like there's value in like redrawing the same scene um, over and over again. Um, and I have also like, especially when I'm traveling, sometimes I don't have all the time in the world to like draw something. So I'll just kind of sketch out the sort of framework of it, take a picture and then finish it later. Like use the photograph as the reference. That's what it looks like um, he was doing here. Um, and I forget who said it on, uh, on Monday, but, um, better draw on this. Do you want, why don't I let you share and then you'll have, do you want to screen share the, from your computer, the um, mural board, and then you'll have more uh, functionality on it. Sure. You can see that, right? Yes. I think it might have been Henry who was suggesting it. It's always the way that I start drawing these kinds of things because the the sort of basic sort of geometry of the of the thing um, can help you establish things like where vanishing points are. Um, so that's that's kind of how I would start. That's kind of crooked, but uh, that's how I would start drawing this this thing um the trickier part is like in like where the windows are so i usually try to do that and then just by eye gut judging how far apart these things actually are and knowing that you know vertically they they line up or if they do or they don't <clears throat> are the, those are the kinds of things that you're kind of looking for so it's a nice space, I think. You know, it's the kind of space that I would be drawn to as well, like to actually sketch and draw because of, because of that. It's pretty, um, pretty interesting in that in that regard. I also like what Henry was talking about too when he was he showed us the video of the, I think it was a towel or a blanket that was hanging over the balcony. It's the one sort of thing that's moving in this scene that that you wouldn't normally see and, and how do you begin to draw that you know like if there was for instance if there was water dripping from the air conditioners or something like that that had been there over time um, I would start to draw those kinds of things in it as well <clears throat> It was interesting when I was drawing, I was um, I, I was trying to think about those things because I was drawing, for, I was also drawing from a photo. Um, it's a photo of a place where I sp spend a lot of time in, in South Africa and my friend sent it to me this uh, this week and, and who's part of the sketching school as well. And, uh, he, and, and it's an interesting perspective. And so, uh, um, but I used I used the white pencil, which you had talked about, which I found really interesting because it gave sort of an ethereal um, quality to the drawing. Um, if you scroll to the left, you'll see you'll see the drawing. Yep, that one there, um, and. Uh, so it was trying to also um, talk about the history of the place in that drawing. It's an it's an apartheid monument, and that's re recently been vandalized by in civil civil disobedience during the the or or um, during the COVID pandemic. And um, so, how to like begin to include some of those relationships into the drawings and um, and I really liked I didn't have it I didn't have the opportunity this week to try your your technique of printing with a with a um, laser jet and then 
do you, I wanted to actually ask you about that. Do you rub that onto the drawing? Is that how that, is that how you? Yeah. Works? I have one here. So the one that, this is the marker that I found works. It's specifically made by Chart Pack. It's a colorless blender. I found that like the Prismacolor version doesn't work as well. Um, I think what it has in it is xylene, also um, acetone works. And so if you have anything that's printed on, um, that has toner on it. So I'll just take this like sort of print out. What I do is I um, flip the paper over and then I use this marker So I'll just like kind of saturate the back of it. And then when I put it on the piece of paper, I use the back of the marker just to rub it on. And so what it does is it transfers on to the piece of paper. But obviously if this is not backwards, this is going to be backwards when you, uh, when you put it onto the thing. Sometimes that, that can be an interesting effect. Um, I use that when I put images of things or if I want sometimes text. Um, like the scale animals I have in my drawings, that's usually how I do that. Or if there's something like complex, like uh, Jenna in your drawing, I would like Photoshop the squirrel with the scissors and then I would print that out and then I would place it on the drawing in that way. So you wouldn't have to draw the whole thing. Uh, I think that, that the mix between like image and drawing, I think is interesting. And, and so I try to be selective about that, but um, but yeah, that's, that's that's how I do that. I also found it interesting to to sort of freehand sketch and then get my straight edge out and begin to add complexities and sort of layers to the drawing in 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 that change of technique. I I found really interesting, which I hadn't. I mean, I hadn't really. I don't think consciously done sketching that way before, other than to sort of lay out you know, like grid lines or something like mm -hmm. that. So I found that quite interesting to do as well. Um, yeah. Hella, are you, are you ready to show, to show your drawings? Sure, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so honored to be able to show you my work and get your insights on it. Um, so just for a little bit of context, um, I've been throughout my education, I've been researching the architecture of occupation and colonialism. Being Palestinian, I'm always with the struggle of creating the space of the space of belonging and exile. And usually what I've been doing is um, like Chris, you suggested uh, sketching on vellum and kind of compiling those, making them into one drawing. Um, but I think uh, one thing I might be maybe a little bit too concerned of, and maybe because I'm teaching architecture, is I always try to make it a space too fast, and maybe I don't need to. I don't know. I, I think that's a really <laughs> interesting comment. I, I like that. It's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but after your presentation, what I did is I went and created my own sketchbook of vellum and I kind of took my initial ideas and turned them into like raw points. So um, there's this, um, um, so Israel is now uh, um, designing a park. They're building a park on a Palestinian cemetery. And what I wanted to do is I've been studying the bulldozer, the movement to the bulldozer is this machine of eraser. But then what I thought is after your presentation, I took a human skeleton and I started to overlay the skeleton with the bulldozer. So when are we trying to see how the, the skeleton themselves can become that machine? I don't know, oh, sorry, yeah. So that's kind of what I'm like messing around with, but. Wow. So did, could you tell us about, was there a uh, strategy to what's blue and what's black? So I started the blue with the, the bulldozer itself and then um, the black was the skeleton. And then when I moved on to the second layer, the blue became the core. I was starting to think of a, um, 
like a, a datum for the drawing. So that on the left, the blue becomes the datum. Um, yeah. It's a really intriguing connection for sure because of the articulated joints of the, yeah. the bulldozer and the articulated joints of the body. I think it's saying some really powerful things. Um, I like how it's overlaid. It's almost like I, I like the, is the one on the left the backside of the one on the right? Yeah. Okay. I, I kind of like that. And so what I would do is I would do more of that kind of drawing on the other side so that the one on the right looks like the one on the left. You know what I'm saying? Like so the, that front and back drawing. And I don't know, you could decide, I mean, it's completely up to you, whether one side or one color is one thing, meaning like this is bulldozer machine and then this is um, body. Yeah, well, I, I really like how you strategize your drawings. I think that's one thing I need to work on is like my, my drawing language. And I'm wondering if you have any advice as to how do you start to create your own language even when drawing in 2D? That, that's a good question because, you know, as I'm, I'm looking at it, that's what I'm trying to help you do. And in some ways, to be honest, I just start with that thing, like what you have here, this bulldozer human remains sort of um, dialogue. And what I find is that in drawing those connections, it's it's a that the drawing itself starts to take on its own life in a way, right? Like, for instance, like do, do is there a connection between the bodo, bulldozers? Um, where it is, oops, sorry, is it, I'm trying to get my drawing thing here. Um, you know, some correspondence between that and feet, because I think that scale doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be one-to-one -one scale here, right? Like a bone doesn't have to equal the right. part of the machine. Okay. I, I love this thing here where it's, look, it's starting to look like a rib cage and other sorts of things. Like, I think that ambiguity is interesting. Okay. So I would, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I would just go into that part of the drawing and start to embellish it more. Sometimes it can be very powerful if you decide to focus on one part of the drawing. Like if that was a rib cage and it started to get really sort of, you were very precise about the shading of the thing. Um, that could be interesting. I love that. Is it when, when, when drawing, you know, quick kind of sketches and drawings like this, should I be thinking about the spatial structure at all? In terms of the paper or the objects? The objects themselves. I don't, to be okay. honest, like, I almost wish it was two drawings, but maybe it's not. So you know, like this thing, I want to know more about like how this thing articulates, right? Like, is there some sort of zone or radius that the thing takes? That's where you can start to imply movement with like dash lines and other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there are different versions of articulation here, meaning that I, I would guess that this, this cab thing can pivot in this direction too, right? right. Yeah. And the scooper, this, this is what I would do. I mean, it's I'm kind of thinking about it like it, as if it were my drawing. Like I see the the thing that makes it move as the feet, this claw thing as the hand. And so um, that's where I would start to try to draw that in. I wouldn't, I mean, personally, I wouldn't worry about the space of the paper. Like I would just keep drawing that stuff in and then you start to decide, okay, these things are more important. And that's where I start to spend more time on uh, shading it or uh, coloring it, uh, highlighting it. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. I can do that. I can try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this element here in because it's so, it, to me, it, it, mim it mimics in many ways the, this element here. And so, especially given the background that you talked about with, uh, um, and, and, you know, the reality I've been reading about, you know, the, 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 the park and cemetery, um, and it's, it, it, it becomes, 
the the bulldozer it becomes almost inner becomes almost human you know so that the it it gives it it begins to communicate the sort of human intentionality and the human element it's not just a bulldozer that's doing this it's actually you know um more of a a, a living reality that's doing it um so i i yeah i think it's a really powerful drawing but, but the the like detail of the joints and and how you've shaded them and connected them i think that mimics this i find i find really powerful i i think the the the, the lecture series was really helpful because before i was like drawing the threshold but i think the past week i've been in the threshold so i really appreciate the the lecture um from last week. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. And then Kristen, the way you initiate the dialogues is really interesting. So now I feel like I'm drawing in the threshold and I'm not just drawing the threshold. So thank you for that. It, it, it's interesting, Sechaba, who was the collaborator the first week, he and I are very old and, and uh, good friends. And he and I have been talking a lot since we started sketching um, through this sketching school and how much it's brought up and um, and I agree with you. I, I also find myself in drawing from a very different space. Um, that drawing I did this week, uh, it, that's a, an apartheid, an anti-apartheid movement monument. And, and um, a young man died there this past week. And, um, you know, which speaks to the reality that this, these, these events, like what you're talking about here as well, they, it, they're not just like moments in history. They're, they're, they're ongoing and have enormous human consequence. And um, there's an amazing, if you, if you throw your email in the chat, I'll send you, there's an amazing poem that was written by um, Don Matera during the apartheid struggle in South Africa about bulldozers. When they, when they bulldozed Sophia Town, which was, a, which was an amazing multiracial community in, South, in Johannesburg. Um, and it's a, I often use it in, in presentations and things because I'm also fascinated by the, the, you know, the, the actions of a bulldozer and how easy it is. Um, yeah. well, and, the, and the timber, what the timber industry does effectively the same with our forests, with the machinery they use. And um, yeah, so I think it's, I, think I, I love that you've brought this big machinery into the drawings and into the idea of space and so on. That's what I do too with the like, um, with the Xerox transfer, toner transfer, is when you're searching Google images, you could change what it's looking for. And so usually you'll just get pictures, right? But there are options in it where you can get diagrams or it was black and white, you can tell it. So sometimes when I've done ex drawing exercises with students, I'll just ask them to go find pictures of machines and then to use the transfer to put the machine in. Which is something you could do too, because I like I like this image on the on the right here, which looks like it's all three D modeled. Um, but it would be interesting to see like the illustrations of the actual machine um, that that are overlaid with this thing. That's what kind of what I like about the one on the left here too. Is that we see pieces of the machine just enough to recognize it, and I think it could be interesting too if you started to put um, like anatomical drawings in it as well. So that we see those sort of visual connections between the joints of the machine and the joints of the body. I love that. Is it okay if I share one more thing very quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, speaking of the machine, I, I was fortunate enough to uh, present at the Architecture of Hiding Symposium that was um, um, by the Carleton University. And what I did was actually, um, I, I got a bulldozer and um, I got a bulldozer and a um, a typewriter and I dis disassembled both of them and then put them together to kind of like recreate this um, this like three D model which came from this drawing um, but I, I tried to use similar techniques that we would use in drawings like the layering and the transparency but yeah. So it's a physical model. Mm -hmm. 
I do an entire, I've done it both at the undergraduate level and graduate level where a part of the lesson is basically anything can be drawn to, to students because I, I'm trying to break them out of this, like I got to conceive it in my mind and then I can represent it. So what I do is I ask them first, the first step is to make a collage, which is just completely finding borrowed imagery. The second step is to make physical models out of machines. Uh, and I always tell them the typewriter is the best machine <laughs> because one, it has like a, a manual, even a, a, an old typewriter, right? It's got a thousand parts in it. Mm -hmm. And each one of those parts, I just feel aesthetically are fantastic. They're just like beautiful things. But the thing, the lesson there is that the people who engineered and made the thing weren't thinking about aesthetics at all. They're just thinking about mechanical engineering. Like I press the K and it types a K, right? Like there's a whole mechanism of stuff. But my point is the pieces within it are interesting. So I asked them to disassemble that and then to make these smaller models. And then I asked them to photograph those models and trace them so that they're drawing what they've traced and then cut a section through it. You don't have to know exactly what's in it, but it gets them to this whole um, sort of way of thinking that is more subjective in a way that is to say, I know what I like, and I like this shape and I don't like that shape. And, and then what happens when I redraw that shape? And there's a whole exercise that we go from that drawing and then there's a whole sort of series of drawings that are more like my Alcatraz drawings uh, that they do. And then we use 3D modeling to make those things into forms um, as well. So I, I think this is really fantastic. And so I would say, you know, it's certainly worth doing that with this. Like, what, what are the drawings of this start to look like? And I think it could probably inform the other pieces. I'm gonna try that for sure, yeah. Thank you so much, thank you. I really appreciate your time. Did you this paint this like after you made it? Like all yeah. Gray? yeah. That was a good move because the other thing is like i think we make these associations between the color of a thing right like yeah when i think like painting it in this sort of gray color i like to use grays and, and whites uh, so that it makes everything equal and we're just looking at form and shape right right because the machines can be a little distracting when yeah especially two different things mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm, Thank mm -hmm. you. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Hala, I don't know if you are, are familiar with, I just wanted one of the resources that I've dropped into the mural board is um, this a questionnaire on decolonization. Okay. It's, and um, the authors are Palestinian and it's, and if you go, their whole book is online. And it's a really interesting book and, and uh, with, you know, various collaborators and um, they, are, they are architects themselves and it talks about their practice and how they brought decolonization and, and um, into their practice. And, and so it's a, I'd really recommend it. Will do. I'll, Thank you. I'll um, send you the link to the PDF of the whole book when I send you the poem as well. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Mehdi, do you have drawings that you'd like to share? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Uh, I would like to introduce myself because uh, the people, they know me, they are not here at this point. Um, most of the Atabasco people, I had a chance to meet with them uh, and introduce myself before in a, in a lengthy few hours session. Um, I am Mehdi, I am from Iran. I am a registered architect in Canada. Uh, I arrived to Canada 20 years ago and I didn't know anything about the wood frame structure and then I start to going to the job site after 12 years of experience teaching architecture in back home in Iran and uh, running lots of uh, freehand uh, drawing classes. And then uh, when I learned how to do 
things uh, in uh, wood frame, I start to getting a couple of courses in building code and then my career starts from there. I become a licensed architect in uh, Ontario and then moved to Alberta and I did uh, 10 years of teaching at Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. And that picture frame over there, students uh, nominated me for six times to as an excellence of teaching. And then eventually college gave that to me as the basically reward of uh, among all the instructors in the college. And I'm so honored about that. Last semester, I was teaching <clears throat> freehand drawings to the students remote. <clears throat> so right now I'm in Ottawa. I'm a faculty at Algonquin College and teaching remotely online to the students uh, in Edmonton was uh, what was quite uh, basically fascinating. Here is uh, what we start with. So students had uh, basically the chance of getting the preliminary course to learn how to draw first. And this was a urban sketching class that we started teaching it online and the students were basically sharing their work in Padlet. And we start from a storytelling. How do you want to tell a story? Just uh, uh, for, for the time being, let's use coffee as, as a conversation. So they started kind of creating a drawing using coffee as the, as the subject to that. So some of them, they did it with the different lenses, so to speak. And, and these are basically the results of that class. Uh, today, I wanted to kind of come to see the feedback, how Chris and other professors here providing the feedback so I can learn to teach better. And I, I learned a lot from you, Chris. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge in, uh, in this uh, basically environment. Uh, after we did the coffee, so we tried to bring some writing to it. So if you uh, do uh, uh, draw a coffee things and then you want to write something which uh, text the style are you going to use and the students start to finding and sharing and then they start to do some lettering on that and uh, those uh, basically practices came together as some sort of practice we wanted to give the students the chance to just draw and draw and and let, let that go. And then that fear of, I don't know how to draw goes away. And the students start to kind of developing the storytelling using all those sketches. Knowing that the students had one, two uh, credit course prior to this in fundamentals of drawing. Uh, they knew perspective, they knew uh, shade and shadow, they knew textures. And we start to using all those uh, tools that they grasp them to, uh, to describe a uh, basically concepts over and over and see how they can uh, come to a conclusion of basically expressing themselves on the piece of paper. So these are all the students work and they shared it on uh, Padlet. And sometimes I would have, I would have draw myself uh, using the things I have here. I would like to share it with you if I get a chance to change my camera here so I can show you uh, what we have done in class. So there is a, I, I tried to put this on to see if, um, probably now you can see it. This is a dark cam at my desk so you can see my uh, sketchbook right here. And we started from teaching just basically a couple of lines. And when they start to learning to how to draw, lines and get loose. So they did it in a different directions. We have done a couple of textures, uh, talking about the perspective and adding entourage into a perspective. And then some textures, writing names, how the values and things are going like that and all those uh, perspectives and uh, things uh, in a lettering. So that was the connection, the concept of connection. So we gave them this picture and they, everybody's drawn that. It was a help to draw some one point perspective and, and things like this. To give them the opportunity to draw quickly in the class while we, are, while we were live. 
let me go back to uh, the, um, I think this is a too small, I, sh I should have stopped sharing so you could have see these a little bit larger. So this tool that I am using was really helpful while I am drawing things in, in my sketchbook, they could have see it and they could have follow as while I was taking basically those sketches and showing them how to do that. Um, these are the developing stories that we all as the community of, of teachers, the educators, uh, we may have some of these uh, basically tools and methods that cross the point and help the students during the COVID to how to do things so that can be an option to be shared. And, and the, the most I was going to share today was uh, telling my story as the educator to how I came to uh, basically teach students remotely. And most of people, they were thinking it's not possible to do that, but uh, it, was a, it was a great ex experience. Um, the, the results of that are on my uh, sketch, um, um, bored in a padlet, so just changing the camera to myself, and yeah, and that was uh, that was basically what I was going to share today to tell my colleagues that we've done that, and the students were enjoyed it a lot, and we came to some sort of good conclusion based on what we were uh, experiencing in class, and trying to kind of go from an isolated object and then put them together in order to create a composition and uh, basically uh, showing how we basically did it uh, together. These are the things that the students found out. One of, the, one of the students was working for a hardware store and he took that picture with his, um, with his uh, cell phone and then he shared it with the class. So we started doing that with the other classmates, they could have not even imagined a bunch of nuts and bolts and, and uh, those tools become look like that and it creates a good perspective. So not only just drawing, but only teaching the, the kids to how to see things and how to uh, describe them in a, in a geometry uh, was the point of uh, teaching. And we uh, spent some time to do some portraits and uh, students did some of them they were did an amazing job by uh, doing that uh, basically a sketches uh, from a famous architect's faces and it become some sort of um, the second habit of those students we were trying to push that in order to get them do more and when you do more you will learn more and practice makes you more expert on the field that you are basically on and how you can talk with your client using these tools as you are sketching and uh, taking on in a design can be a good tool to communicate. Let's say <clears throat> the point uh, Chris was making in the start of this conversation, he analyzed the shape. So this is how we analyzed it. I drew those lines for them first. Okay, so this is now you know this. If you remove this picture now, you already have one, two, three lines vertically almost, and then one, two, three lines going horizontally. By six lines, you can basically put this geometry to bed, and then you carve into it as uh, it moves forward. If I turn this off, you can uh, share it and you can com complete it with uh, closed eyes. So these were a bunch of techniques we tried to give those students uh, help with. And uh, that was basically my story. I, want, I wanted to kind of um, share what we did in class. And I used the benefit of seeing my other colleagues, how they provide the um, feedback to the students, which it was the, a great opportunity to sit here. I wish more uh, work were, were here and uh, Chris would have provided us with his insight into those pictures. However, the students are kind of missed this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's sad, but that's it. I think those are really wonderful exercises. I, I feel like, you know, in order to teach students how to draw, one, they just have to be drawing, right? And, um, yeah. and drawing things that already exist is a great way of doing that. You know, for me, just personally, like the next step I would do is to take 
what happens when I start to change the scale of those things, right? Like, uh -huh. and can I start to mix things, meaning like the portraiture of people? Can I start to draw people at the scale of the small sort of hardware pipe thing, right? Um, and start to reassemble the drawings in a way that uh, it's almost as if you were photoshopping them together, but you're actually drawing <clears throat> them um, to create those narratives, right? Then you have to invent the narrative, like how did this person get inside this pipe or how did this thing start to move? Um, I've always told students too that, you know, we draw these complex things first because then drawing buildings becomes a little bit easier actually, you know, like when you're drawing complex things in the world uh, and understanding how light works, how sh shade and shadow works, how form works, what, and then even how to compose a frame or where object is, where sky is, um, then drawing your own projects should be easier uh, because you can, can see the world differently. And it's really about what I appreciate about what you've shown is that you're teaching the students how to see things and then how to yes. draw what they're seeing. Exactly. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. That was the first step. So if you can see things that's around you and you can see the proportion, you can see the main frame and the skeleton of the object. Therefore, when you are thinking about a project, you appreciate those skeletons. And in, in, in the final class, we were asking students to uh, pick an architectural uh, building, I mean, the architectural piece uh, designed in a older or newer and try to analyze it and then write about it. So in, in the final projects, they, they not only had to draw things, but also they needed to put some words together to, to criticize or describe what was the main point that they grasped and how they translated to the language of freehand sketching in order to present uh, what they have comprehended from that piece of architecture. It was, it was a great experience and uh, I appreciate your feedback because uh, sometimes you need to have a peer review, sitting down and then listening to what others are talking about the class. And I, I, I truly appreciate that, uh, Chris. Um, I wanted to say as well, I think it's great both Henry began and then Chris, you talked about it this morning and, and now Maki, you've shown it as well. How with just a few drawings, you can, you can capture um, the, sorry, with a few lines, you can capture the space. Cause I think a lot of students feel sort of look at a building or a landscape and are sort of intimidated by it. And I think exactly you job of showing how with a few lines, you can actually um, really jump into the to the drawing. I just wanted to also, I, I'm also really interested in the idea of narratives and drawing and storytelling. And I included these graphic novels. Um, these are some amazing, an amazing series of um, indigenous graphic novels that are done up here in, in, in Canada. And, um, and, this one here is entirely available online. It's so you can just download it, the, the, this place. Um, and as well, the, uh, this is a beautifully dr fully drawn short film. And um, Yasuke is a, new, is a new anime film that I, and I think, you know, all of these can be really interesting ways to kind of relate drawing and storytelling together. And, and like I, with the anime, I think it's another example of, of putting different scales and different um, uh, characters and landscapes that you wouldn't necessarily put together. Um, and I think in a way it, it, it reminds me going back to Jenna, to your drawing that we started with of the sort of dreams in some ways, anime, I think can be almost like a dreamscape sometimes. So I think that, that those are all really interesting resources to look at as well. Um, Does, does anyone else have any, any questions for, for Chris? Or Chris, is there anything else you'd like to um, share as far as technique or? Um, let's see, well, a couple images I might show here. Here, I'll stop sharing actually, sorry. There we go.
So um, a few times I've taught, we had a, a winter room, which was basically a short session between during the winter break that students could take. I taught a sort of sketchbook class. We basically just filled the sketchbook in four weeks in the, in the class. So one of the exercises I had them do was to create, we created these frames. Um, so there's basically four frames in your sketchbook spread. And then I just showed them sort of basic perspectival techniques to be able to um, draw a perspective within that frame. So you can see the two vanishing points on the sides here. But one of the things that I did with them in this, I did a couple of things. One was talking about composition and the rule of thirds, right? <clears throat> that it, within the frame, and filmmakers use this, photographers use it, um, that your subject is usually off to the right third or the left third. And if, if you see filmmakers or photographers use the middle of the frame, it's usually for a very strategic you know, thing, right? So Stanley Kubrick uses it in The Shining to make it seem creepier, right? When we see the long hallway and the two twins at the end of the hallway, or like the blood rushing down the middle of the frame, he, that he does that for very strategic and cinematic effects. And I think that we can do the same thing in the ways that we're drawing things. The other thing that I talked about too, is the use of the frame itself, like whether or not you show us the, the dark frame around the thing or the frame stops, or there's specific things that come out of the frame. Sometimes here it's the ground, sometimes it's the ceiling. In this case, in this perspective, it's the floor just breaks across the entire page. Um, and so the, the point there is in, or like, for instance, the floor. So when I was drawing these things, I was just explaining to them that I'm just imagining the space. The space is being designed as I'm drawing it. And so it's mostly about perspective. For me, just personally, it's like, it's almost like, um, uh, like a meditation or it's very soothing to me to draw perspectives because they're pretty reliable, right? Like what a floor surface is. And then I can just, what happens if I draw a hole in that floor surface? Or what if I start to imply the things with the dash line that you can't see? And what if that hole in the bottom surface, there's a corresponding hole in the top, and then I draw a ladder in it. So it's just in that exercise of drawing the perspective that two things are happening. One, I'm just, I'm getting better at drawing perspective, but two, I'm allowing my brain to like not think about the thing and then draw the thing. It's like, as I'm drawing, it's becoming part of that design thing. And then I talked to them about, well, uh, what gets shaded in? Is it a cross hatching, like, um, you know, hatching in the, the sky here? Uh, th there's a line of trees that are all perspective or does it become darker? Like, it's just very simple sort of things. I and mean, all of it is to get them out of this idea that, okay, this is all one scene that I'm trying to draw or trying to configure. Um, but it's in the way that I start to uh, make the thing that I can begin to uh, think about how I how I draw the uh, the piece. Um, yeah, I did. See. I, I don't know if uh, I if you guys had a, had a look, but I um, Chris's w uh, website for his firm is on is on the mural board, and Chris, I I spent some time looking through your drawings as I was doing working on my drawing and I found that, um, you know, like for example, the, the red below the, the, the ground plane in my drawing, that was something I tried in, uh, after looking at some of your drawings and it, it just to play around with the idea of how that drastically changes the, the, the reading of the drawing by not necessarily giving it. Um, I was also fascinated by that person in that drawing that just went by. This one, yeah. I, I love the energy that that gives. Um, but to give the ground plane a totally non-natural color um, was was really interesting, and sort of to think about how that energizes the, and communicates something quite different about the ground plane, mm -hmm. and the, and the relationship to the land, really, you know. Mm -hmm. Like one, this is one of my travel sketches. I actually, this this particular drawing has won two different awards, but I didn't think about that when I was drawing the thing. But I, when I travel, I use both watercolors and I use watercolor colored pencils, right? <clears throat> and that's what because in a section, all of that whatever that stuff is is kind of it's a, it's a construct, right? It's not I'm not worried about what it is, and so that's why I like put like bright orange in it, um, just to say. 
I was really in, intrigued by how this piece is held within this space um, and showing that. And then I drew like little one point perspectives in each of the corridors. So it was a, a while of me just like sitting in this courtyard, drawing this whole thing and then moving around the space to go and say, oh, well, what, what is this actually like? And so when I talk to students about this, I said, well, when we draw sections, especially like if we're drawing it from a 3D model, like we treat things as too neutral, right? Like there's a straight line for the ground and there's a vertical line for the wall. But what happens at that joint between the ground and the wall? And so even here where I indicated the pathway by just making those small sort of like indent in, in the line that trying to teach students that um, the world is not that neutral. And so when we change, even when we change ground planes, that line can do something. Like if we, we can apply that it's soft or it's hard with the way that we draw, uh, draw it. And then I started doing this thing here too, where I started to draw like plan perspectives where I used the plan it's, we're normally drawing perspectives of space that is like in front of us, but we can project up at the same time um, to create these kind of planned perspectives of, of things. So it's just a different way of seeing it. And you can draw it from the ground. It's just a matter of like understanding perspective uh, principles. Well, and I think it's interesting how th that red around that building, it sort of reads as the energy of the of the city that actually surrounds that because we kind of that somehow gets lost sometimes when it's just the drawing on a white page mm -hmm. whereas whereas here you you sort of feel that energy of that um of the city that surrounds this i don't know if you guys um are, are familiar chris just mentioned these I, I find them really useful especially when you're when you're drawing in the city or somewhere they're just um pencils but then you can go back and do the watercolor element of it. Um, so they draw just like pencils, but, but then you can add water to them and, and, they, add, and they then behave like, like watercolor paint. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of an interesting thing to add to your, to your collection of drawing materials. Yeah, I'm using that here. Sometimes I'll just use the like I'll just use a watercolor brush on the tip of the pencil because once you hit it, it's like a pan of watercolors, right? Like when you put water on it, you can use it as, as a watercolor. Yeah, uh, looking through these also, Chris, it gave me courage to like not to use colors that wouldn't necessarily go there. I think it's like the comment um, that, uh, I think Hala, you made of, of us wanting to make things spaces and, and using the different color, I found um, kind of helped me get out of that mode. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know, maybe it's a personal, personal preference, but I tend to use, I like uh, fluorescent colors too, uh, just using them as accent. This is an image where like I was at the Villa Savoie and I had sketched out these seven sort of thumbnails. I did them really quick, uh, knowing that, you know, this is how Corb thought about the project is that this architectural promenade of approaching, you know, approaching this, the part that I hadn't until I had gone there understood and seen differently than I saw as a student as a, and a teacher was the approach to the thing from the city that it, you know, there's this gate on the outside. I never knew about the gatehouse. The gatehouse looks like a mini version of the Villa Savoie. Uh, so you come in the gate, you turn to the right and it's there and then this pathway, and then you get these glimpses of it as you're walking up to the thing. Uh, and then you get to the entrance and the sort of culmination of the piece is in the, you know, the roof garden part of it where you're sitting in the living room and you can see out to this um, thing. But when I drew this, I just sketched the thumbnails. I sketched them all very quickly. And then later that night in the hotel is when I did the, all the watercoloring on this um, thing. So sometimes I'll do that if I don't have the time to just you know sit there for hours and, and do it. I'll just sketch the things out quickly and then add uh, detail later. This is really interesting because when we often draw, we almost want to like create a painting or like a, a finished product every single time. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about revisiting sketches, right? So 
So that's really cool. A few years ago, I went to um, an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the, the Met Modern. And it was one of my favorite exhibits I've ever been to, I think, because it was all unfinished works of, you know, these great masters throughout from, from quite, you know, old, old um, artists to, to contemporary artists. And, it, and every, every piece of artwork was unfinished. And I found it, I just fell in love with it. The, and, and it was interesting in my drawing that I posted today, I had to like battle with myself to leave that left-hand side of the page kind of looking unfinished because I think it um yeah it gives sort of a dyna dynamic to the to to the piece well this has been great everybody thank you so much for for coming um do you want do you have more that you would like to share with us Chris or is that I think that's it unless people have questions I can answer specific questions about things too uh, in your school, Chris, uh, how many um, courses students need to take as a, uh, as a freehand drawing course as a part of the curriculum, which is what's going to be the core course that mm -hmm. they as a mandatory course, how many they need to take and how long does it take for them to basically go over that? Um, that's, that's one thing that's very different. So I'm at a new institution now. I'm at the University of New Mexico, and I was at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee for 17 years, and I taught a representation there. It's one of the things we don't have here at UNM is um, there's no core representation course, and um, that's the one thing I'm, I want to try to start. But we found in Milwaukee, I want to say maybe about 10 years ago, or let we used to draw do it where they had hand drawing one semester and then they did digital stuff the next semester. And what we always found was that the students stopped hand drawing <laughs> once they got the computer. Oh. So what I did is to try to figure out how to mix those two things. Um, and when I started teaching in that curriculum, that's what, what, what I decided to do was to, to take the, the hand tools and the digital tools and kind of mix them together. So even in some of the drawings that I'm showing you here, like I'll use Rhino or I'll use Illustrator to help me make things that I then trace or um, start to replicate. Um, but we, you know, it's one of the things I'm going to try to start here is to build a curriculum that is not just for undergrads, but it actually extends into the grad program as well. Because I think at the grad level, then you could start to say, well, here's, a, here's another level of technique and then allowing the grad students to run with those techniques, right? Um, I think is the kind of approach that we're trying to take. What, what I normally tell my, my students is, if you sit in a computer without having any sketch done prior to doing your work, you're going to waste a lot of time. Do not try an error with computer. Just sit down, do something by hand, come up with the idea, and the sketch comes from your head to the piece of paper much faster. And then you're going to save a lot of time prior to sitting in a computer. Uh, you said the University of Milwaukee. Uh, the professor, he was, he was my uh, professor during uh, the school, teaching how to all doing this uh, uh, freehand drawings what was from the University of Milwaukee. He's a grad from that university. I left his link into our chat box if you like to see him, Olam Hussein Naomi. He's very uh, famous in, uh, in Iran. And uh, right now he lives in Toronto, but uh, he was, uh, he, he's a graduate from University of Milwaukee. Hmm. <sighs> Apparently, that university is basically famous for freehand and whatnot. It was, uh, you know, it did in the, even in the, well, the school started in the 70s. I actually went to undergrad there. I started in the late 80s and um, Frank Ching taught there. So there was a, actually a very long history of drawing and representation that came out of that school and that uh, during that time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, it's coming from the schools that they emphasis on that. It helps uh, students to bring what they have in mind in a piece of paper in a way that's absolutely fascinating. As yeah. uh, Christian said, even unfinished work is uh, beautiful and can be uh, full of inspiration. I show students too, like I do a lot of like, if I draw something in my sketchbook, I scan it and then I put it into Rhino and I start 3D modeling on that thing. Oh because I God. found that if I tried to replicate it, 
like mm -hmm. to say, oh, I'm just going to scale it. That doesn't work as well. Like the proportions uh -huh. are all off. So I just literally will scan the drawing, put it into Rhino and start, start building making that. the 3D model from there. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for sharing all this information with us today, Chris. That's, uh, it was very, very fascinating. Thank you. I've, one of the things I've found interesting about just the process of doing of doing the sketching school is I find myself I, I just take photos of my drawing as I'm going along and because I know I need to share it and so on. And, but it, it allows you to to like change the focal point of the drawing it allows you to put it in like, uh, like the freedom the text that I added to the drawing that I did put that in Photoshop and then use the played with the transparency layers in in Photoshop as a way to do that. And um, I also found it it allowed me to be braver with my drawings because, you know, we tend to you talked a little bit about this on Monday, Chris, about, you know, we get hung up on the preciousness of our drawings and um, to, to sort of photograph it, then I was, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I, I have I have that drawing, but I can always show that now I'm going to do something else to it. And it allowed me that it, it that the sort of courage to, to try new things that I thought would, you know, ruin, could, could ruin, quote unquote, the drawing, mm -hmm. which in, fact, in most cases, you know, pushed it further. So um, I think all of these are really useful and kind of, um, even if you're not having to share them, just as techniques to help yourself push your drawings further, I think. So it's, yeah, I, I, I'm loving how much I'm learning doing, doing this sketching school. These days I'm passing by the neighborhood going back and forth and I'm intensely busy with the work and construction we do in our basement to create some offices there, uh, a lot of work, but after this uh, class, my eyes start to looking again into the neighborhood mm -hmm. and I'm kind of capturing, oh, this can be a nice subject to draw. That can be a good story to describe. That person is walking that dog has a nice gesture that we can capture for, for this. And uh, it's very refreshing thanks to uh, the organizers of this series. Thank you. Um. Well, thank you everyone for, for sharing your drawings and, and, and how I particularly um, enjoyed seeing, seeing your work and how you're bringing um, the sort of social dynamics of, of the sort of complexities that our society is facing and, and tragedies that our society is facing, because that's something that I um, work on a lot and, and think about a lot. And, so um, I really appreciated seeing your drawings this morning. Um, Thank you, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks so much, Chris, again, for, yeah. for your time. And it's been, it's been really great uh, learning from you. So um, we will see everybody on Monday, hopefully again. And, um, sure. And thanks again. Have a, thanks, good, have a good weekend. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.